Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to have to be here with you today. Um, and I would like to, to allow me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Muhammad al mutlaq today. He is a consultant in our division of interior segment, and he's also the head of bank uh, services, uh, the head of the iBank services here at KCash as well. Uh, he's going to be talking to us today about one of the hottest topics in ophthalmology, and that is the current trends in the management of uh, presbyopia. Uh, allow me to welcome Dr. Mohammed and let's start our talk. Again, I'll start with the definition. It's a normal aging process where we lose the elasticity uh, of the lens and the lens becomes hard and then we have a degradation of visual accommodation and this will translate into a loss of functional near vision and intermediate. And we all now live in a near world and intermediate world. Most of our daily lives are within the near and intermediate vision. Most of our work with the uh, phone, laptops, writing and reading. So it touches every aspect of our life. Whenever we have presbyopia, there is a loss of productivity and it will affect the quality of life in a way or another. So presbyopia affects 1.1 billion worldwide. So around 15 to 20% of the population worldwide. And in a study done by Frick and his group, they estimated that there is a loss of $11 billion for the population between 40 to 55 because of presbyopia. This study has been done in the US and they concluded that the economic burden of presbyopia is huge. So there are three theories that uh, uh, try to explain the accommodation and presbyopia and each of which has an element of truth but the oldest, the Helmholtz theory, which talks about the lens changing in shape uh, in relation to the contraction of the ciliar muscle is the closest to the truth. So how do we approach patients with presbyopia? Uh, preferably, we approach them with a detailed history. So we start with taking their needs. We try to define success with them. We try to talk about the circumstances where, uh, where they are prepared to use glasses and when they are not prepared. And in what circumstances where they definitely not want to wear glasses and how much do they use their PCs? What are their hobbies? And for a serious refractive, cataract refractive surgeon or presbyopic surgeon, it's preferably to start with a question here ahead of time with the patient to prepare them to put this objectively in writing with the patient so that the history becomes and the discussion uh, becomes constructive about the solution. So going into presbyopia management, the management really can be divided into two big approaches. The non-surgical approach, which is the classic and it's still valid and work the glasses and contacts and recently the approved drops and then there is the non-surgical approach where we try to approach presbyopia through uh, the cornea, eczema lens, and or the intraocular lenses in all their different forms. And in between, we have the monovision where we can apply this principle on both, either the non-surgical approach or the surgical approach so that we let the patient become independent. Now, for the medical treatment, really in the past, uh, the medical treatment and the drops of presbyopia focuses on two things, the accommodative ability and the depth of field. The, in the accommodative ability element, we try to regain the dynamic process of the lens. We are, try, we are trying to soften the lens so that it can change in shape again. And there is a molecule called the lipoic acid colin astrase that is still uh, under research and under, I, I believe under study of proof of concept to see if it does uh, what it claims of softening the lens. And then there is the depth of field or the pinhole. And there are really four agents. They are the meiotics. They work differently with a different duration of action, but at the end of the day, they provide a pinhole effect so that we can function independently of 
glasses. Each company has their own molecule with their own variation. Now, in the first approach, the first approach of the medical treatment, we have the lipoic acid, where it works directly on the disulfide protein bonds of the lens to restore its flexibility. In a way or another, we're trying to let the cytosol move freely so the lens can change in shape as we see the near uh, and intermediate activities. This is still under research. It has not yet uh, used or FDA approved for practice. And the others, the pupillary myotics, it's more of, it's an easy option, very comfortable to install, long enough to act. Uh, they call it the pupil modulator because they work on, they modulate the pupil to consider them enough to see near, but not to degrade the distance vision. Excellent safety profile. And recently what come under the attention of the media, the recent drop, which is one of them, it has been approved uh, by the FDA. What does, it, this is simply a pilocarpin, a 1.25 concentration. It's fast, it works in 15 minutes and it works for six hours. Now, in the study, they found that the patient who took uh, this drop improved for near activities for three lines compared to those who did not or who did take the placebo. The adverse events, uh, events are minor, and, uh, just like any other pilocarpin, headache, eye redness, but still it's, it's 5% more or less. How about the surgical approach? Now, the surgical approach also can be divided into two forms, either the monovision or the multifocality, inducing multifocal points within either the cornea or the lens. In the monovision, what we're trying to do, we're trying to achieve an artificial anisometropia, keeping one eye for near and the other one for distance. This approach is old and uh, it has been introduced, I believe in the late 60s, and the success rate is around 70% with a good satisfaction reaching up to 90%, but there is a trade-off. There is a chance of reduced contrast, stereopsis, as well as binocularity. Now, what do we do with monovision? We aim for emetropia in the dominant eye and myopia in the non-dominant eye. So we start first with identifying the dominant. This is step one in uh, monovision, and we target the non-dominant for near. We can achieve monovision with contact lenses, with laser vision correction, or intraocular lenses. Now, who is a good candidate, or how do we select our patients for monovision? We select them based on a strong desire to leave glasses and patients who are able to co comprehend the, this concept those patients who has or must, must do before a contact lens trial, a patient who has no tropia or amblyopia of any form, and we should avoid patients who have a strong ocular dominance in one eye. The concept will not work in those kind of patients. Now, in different studies about monovision, they found that the patients with a strong ocular dominance had a form of asthenopia, disorientation, and isometropia. And this has been seen in patients with a strong ocular dominance or patients who had a large difference between the two eyes, such as two or more. Now, what's the ideal amount at, or what's the current recommendation uh, of difference to achieve monovision? The optimal amount of anisometropia should be minus 1.5 to uh, or minus 1.4. Not more than that or not more or less. If you go less, then the chance of losing the near vision is high and what you're gonna gain is more of the intermediate vision. And we call it micro monovision. So, What's the main issue with uh, monovision? Monovision can be disorienting for some patient. Therefore, it's advised to test the concept ahead of time with contact lens before performing uh, the surgery. So a discussion has to be done between the ophthalmologist, the optician, and the patient how to achieve this in the right way. So 
I'm gonna now go to the corneal approach. The corneal approach really can be divided into two forms. Either we're gonna use the laser vision correction, the corneal, the eczema laser, or the end laser. In the corneal laser, uh, we are trying to achieve one of two things. We're either inducing monovision, keeping the patient phacic and just keeping one eye with the near vision and the other one for distance, but we achieve that with the laser vision correction or the other concept called the presbydesic. And I'm going in details about the other concepts. So again, monovision is an artificial creation of anisometropia. Usually monovision is uh, that the dominant is corrected uh, for distance viewing and the non-dominant is corrected for near sightedness. Now in presbydesic, the story is different. In Presby LASIK, we're trying to create multi, multiple focal points for the patient to function and see near, distance, and intermediate through the cornea. And really, it's divided into peripheral Presby LASIK and central Presby LASIK. So we're trying to create rings within the cornea. The central, for example, the peripheral Presby LASIK, the central cornea is preserved for distance vision, and the mid-peripheral is reshaped to facilitate the near. While in central, the central cornea is targeting the near vision and the distance vision is left for the periphery. Almost all the companies, starting from Alcon, Bosch & Lohm, Zeiss, um, Schwind, all of them have their own variation of this concept, but they, they all use the same thing. They are trying to achieve a multifocal cornea different zones, you can use them to see different areas of uh, di uh, di uh, different ranges of vision, near, intermediate, and distance, and they all claim success. So what about corneal inlays? Corneal inlays is a bit different. We're either, again, trying to achieve monovision by increasing the depth of focus or a pinhole effect, or we're trying to alter the index of refraction, changing the corneal power. Now, the advantage of the inlay is that it is reversible. There is no ablation like the presbylasic and the eczema laser. And the second advantage, that, uh, the, the disadvantage, sorry, the, uh, there is a chance of melt, displacement, and a contrast reduction and hyperopic shift. There are three inlays that has been used in the past decade, the raindrop, the presbya, and the camera. The raindrop changes the corneal power it was FDA approved, but the FDA pulled their approval because of corneal haze that it induced. The most commonly performed or used uh, uh, inlay is the camera, where they induce a pinhole. And I'm gonna go in details to talk about it. So in this uh, inlay, uh, we use it as a pinhole. It has a 1.6 aperture a 3.8 diameter with the holes to allow nutrition and passage of light within. And it is inserted in the non-dominant eye. Now the principle is pinhole and it is implanted with the aid of femtosecond laser in a pocket relatively deep in order not to induce haze, 200 to 250. A procedure to similar, simple and similar to LASIK the risk associated is blurriness, haze, fluctuation, dryness, and night vision glare and halos and so on. What we get at the end is an image in focus in different range uh, in the uh, inlays. So now I'm done with the corneal approach. Uh, now, if we try to utilize the press pyropic corrective lenses, we have four forms to deal with pyropic. Uh, with presbyopia. We have the monofocals, we have the accommodating lenses, and we have the multifocals or trifocals, and finally the extended depth of focus. And there is a lot of research that has been done on these lenses. Now first, we can apply the principle that we talked about earlier, the pseudophagic monovision. We can use monofocal lenses to achieve Monovision, we keep one eye for distance and the other one for near, which is the non-dominant eye. What we get in return is a limited dysphotopsia compared to the other lenses, a faster adaptation. And this approach can be utilized 
uh, in the presence of ocular uh, pathology such as cornea or macular or glaucoma or so on, you, you're gonna see later on that you cannot use these lenses in, in any eye with ocular pathology. The only approach that you can apply in those eyes is monovision. It can be utilized in the presence of residual refractive error, PCO, uh, it's a bit tolerating uh, procedure, the pseudophagic monovision. Now, the, other, the, the second approach is the accommodating lenses. And what th these lenses utilize is the optical shift principle. Basically, they are trying to simulate the normal uh, mechanism of the natural uh, accommodation. But in reality, this does not work. These lenses does not move, and the results are very variable. There's very little movement, even when they use, in the literature, even when they use a pilocarpin, uh, the patients did not achieve a good near or intermediate vision. So taking all the evidence together, there is very little evidence that the current designs of accommodating lenses uh, really work for presbyopia. So it fall out of favor, nobody's using it anymore. And not just that, there is an issue of haptic involving IOL tilt, a high risk of PCO. So there is a, a safety issue with these kinds of lenses. That's why it's not popular anymore. Now I'm gonna go to the other forms of uh, uh, presbyopic corrective lenses. But before I go deep into these lenses, the first step or the second step after taking the proper history and uh, for taking the desire of the patient, you have to find your right patient. You have to find a healthy eye with no pathology. So the, the, the patient should not have any form of irregular astigmatism, any form of corneal pathology of any, uh, or maculopathy or glaucoma. You have, the patient should be motivated with a personality that is a bit forgiving away from type A personality. The discussion has to be thorough because these lenses tend to have their own side effect profile and you need to do an extensive accurate testing and uh, so that you uh, not miss any detail about these patients. So I'm gonna focus on two lenses here, the multifocals and the extended uh, depth of focus IOL and really what they do in the trifocal, they provide an, uh, two foci, they focus the light into two foci or more, while the extended depth, they provide a range of focus, a range of vision, an elongated form, so that you see the near and intermediate in the end result. The multifocal come in two flavor, the diffractive multifocal and the refractive multifocal. The popular form is the diffractive multifocal. You're gonna see that almost all the recent designs are diffractive in a way or another. But as you can see here, that we tend to miss some light rays as the light of the image is coming through the eye and therefore, we tend to have loss of image contrasts and because of this loss of light and we tend to have a blurred focus. So there is an optical phenomena up to 20 compared to the monofocal down on the right. So this phenomenon is not there with the monofocal, but it is there uh, in the diffractive form of trifocal. So this discussion has to be taken with with the patient. And that's why I mentioned that a thorough discussion is mandatory whenever you wanna use these lenses with the patient. You have to get the patient ready. So this is what the patient, some of the patients may complain and see. Some of them will adapt in, uh, in a month to six months period, they will get rid of these forms of halos, glare, and some will be bothered to an extent where you have to explain these IOLs. Almost all the forms of premium IOLs, the presbyopic IOLs with their extended depth of trifocal have their, have this phenomena in a way or another in a variable degree. So we have a lot of IOLs uh, of trifocals. Almost every ophthalmic company has their own trifocal, but we have three very popular ones, the Panoptics, the Zeiss Ataliza, and the Physio Fine Vision Trifocals. Now, in a study, 
done comparing those three, what they concluded at the end that they, the, 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 all of the three, that the trifocals provide equal region and distance and near, they provide a good level of spectacle independence. However, intermediate was slightly better in the fan optics at the level of 60 centimeter. Halos were equivalent among the three IOLs. And you can see in this defocus curve that the pan optics perform better at intermediate. So if you find a patient who is seeking like a computer work independence, maybe pan optics would be a, a better option. So should we do multifocals or monovision? Now, in a study th that has looked or, uh, at monovision versus multifocal, and multi they compared both of them and what they uh, concluded that the spectacle independence was better in the multifocal group, but higher proportion of patients were unhappy with the multifocal, mostly due to dysphotopsia, and some of them needed IOL exchange. But you have to note that this study is old, and what they used is the older model of multifocal, not that recent trifocals. And the difference that they found between the monovision and multifocal was small, not that big difference. So monovision still works. So in summary, trifocal improves the near and intermediate. It does what it claims. There is a loss of quality and uh, of vision and visual symptoms. Proper selection is a key whenever you use this expensive technology. And whenever you want to do such a procedure, you need to have YAG laser and eczema to improve your outcome afterward in case of any inaccuracies. Few other points. Whenever you want to try uh, to put a trifocal, you have to aim for emetropia. You have to make sure at the end of cataract surgery that you center the IOL very well, and you have to find uh, the right motivated patient, well selected patient with a healthy eye. How about extended depth of focus? Now extended depth of focus works with a different mechanism. They provide a single elongated focal point, a range of vision. Now there are variation within the extended depth of focus. There is the bioanalogic, there is a small aperture, there is the diffractive and then non-diffractive, all of these variation within the extended depth, but the mechanism is, this, uh, is the same, a range of elongated focal point. The features and benefit, they provide excellent distance visual acuity, improved visual acuity for intermediate functional near vision. Optical quality and phenomena depends on the lens design. It is still there, but slightly less than the trifocal. So should we use trifocal or extended depth? which one offers better results. So in a study that compared and looked at both, they concluded that both provide very good visual outcome, trifocal slightly better in terms of near vision and spectacle independence, but EDOF better in terms of quality and contrast than the trifocals. Few points about trifocal versus EDOF. A trifocal has, a, uh, both of them has high patient satisfaction, both. Both have high spectacle independence. Both have glare, glare and halos. Uh, some, some patients will appreciate them. Some will not feel that they have it. Trifocals are really good for a healthy eye and a patient with a strong desire of spectacle independence. While EDOF is forgiving, is very good for patients who have insecure biometry, a form or another of irregular astigmatism, uh, and it provides a good uh, intermediate uh, visual acuity. Now, finally, I want to talk about uh, a new type of EDOF the, uh, called the IC8 or the Aquifocus or the Small Aperture IOL. It's a pinhole. It's also inserted in the non dominant eye, a form of monovision. It's, uh, it has an anterior. A spheric surface, hydrophobic acrylic lens, and it provided a very good uh, near vision. Uh, and the recommended target whenever you implant such a lens is minus 0.75 diopters, usually inserted in one eye, but there is an issue with the decentration from the natural pupil position 
that this could may, may deteriorate the optical quality. Now, this lens is very tolerant to astigmatic, astigmatism, refractive surprises, and aberrated corneas. So what's the ideal solution for a presbyopia correction? So the ideal solution would be in the future, uh, a solution that preserves distance vision with adequate intermediate and near vision, stable over time, minimally invasive, possibly reversible without side effect, free of collateral negative symptoms. Now in, in conclusion, Today, there are many surgical options to treat breast pyopia, but clearly there is no front runner. A certain option may be effective in one patient, but it will not be as effective in another. The ideal solution would be a solution that uh, lets you regain the natural mechanism and the dynamic process of accommodation of the eye. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. McLeod, for this very uh, detailed and, and informative presentation. Um, if anyone would like to ask any question. Maybe I'll start with one of the questions. Um, you have mentioned a lot of uh, many different types of uh, IOLs or correction of presbyopia. Do you have a particular one that you're more excited about? So I have worked with the pan optics and I did, I did not need to explain any. So I feel, it, but, but my selection criteria is very rigid. So uh, I don't offer it a lot, but I found it to be very effective in what it claims. I commonly use the panoptics for hypopic patients and uh, emetropic. I avoid using them just like the classic tissue uh, for myopic, but I ha I've done it before. And this is for the trifocal, but I'm excited about using the IC8 since we have here in Kekesh a lot of aberrated cornea, keratoconus, uh, patients with irregular astigmatism. I feel that this will be a good solution for many uh, patients who are, who are weird not so sure about their uh, uh, biometry, about their corneas, about their vision ahead of time. All right. Um, have you had any experience with the Vivity, uh, the extended depth of focus? From the not yet, not yet, but this is another lens that I'm ex uh, excited to try. This is a form of EDOF. Now, one advantage that I talked about in the, le uh, in the lecture today, that the EDOF, provide a, a good quality, a good contrast, a good lighting. So maybe that the uh, optical phenomena is slightly less compared to other. So I'm excited also about the vivid. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, assalamu alaikum. Ahla wa sahla, Dr. Uh, I have a question, please. Uh, um, most of the surgical options uh, um, relay on the monovision phenomena. What about the, I mean, acceptance of the patients, that satisfaction of the patient with being using one eye for near and one eye for the far vision? So if you try to explain it for the patient, I find it difficult in the beginning, but if you talk to the optician and try it with the patient and then explain for the patient what we did exactly, did it, did it help in any way, then patients may accept it. And personally, I, I, I did attempt uh, monovision uh, in, the, in the past. I, I'm attempting actually monovision whenever I see patient who is motivated and did a proper contact lens trial of ahead, uh, ahead of time. I mean, without contact lens trial, I strongly advocate against uh, monovision. Um, that's interesting. Um, uh, do you have any target Dr. for Papa? refractive um, error in these patients with the multifocal IOL? Do you okay. keep them plain or do you target a little bit of... Uh... For, for, that, for the trifocals, I aim for emetropia. Because of the image that I showed, uh, you can see here that we have multiple foci. So the, 
the circle of least confusion of, uh, and uh, uh, that happens within the eye will be huge and the patient may not tolerate it if you aim for myopia, large myopia. Okay, I see that. Um, as you mentioned in the beginning of your lecture about the beauty of pilocarpine drops, it has gained a lot of media attention uh, recently, although um, the pilocarpine drops has been there, uh, as you mentioned before. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Hello. Um, well, uh, the answer is that it was clear from the beginning when, when they started the research about the myotic that the myotic will be functioning for uh, breast myopia, even ahead of the other mechanism, which is regaining the accommodation and the elasticity of the, the lens. But the problem was with myotic is finding the right concentration <coughs> of to degrade the distance vision. So uh, in this study, they claimed that the distance vision with 1.25 was uh, excellent. Sorry, yeah, Have they looked at uh, the rates of retinal detachment in these patients? Because some people are concerned with. Uh, no, sure. they did not comment on that. Yeah. All right. Dr. Rafa? Yes, it's the doctor. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Dr. Rafa. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for excellent uh, presentation and a very important um, uh, subject, which is the uh, future of most of the people. And, um, you know, you uh, covered the whole uh, uh, material with a nice presentation and nice uh, diagrams. The breast biopia, you know, I'll comment on some of these uh, things. Monovision, I don't believe in it anymore. We uh, have it for many patients in the past. And, you know, it interrupts both near and far. Because if you correct patient, most of the patient, they need at least plus three. And if you uh, correct with um, plus 1.5, that means it will interrupt the far vision and also the near vision, it will not help. It might help in the beginning for the uh, patient who doesn't have uh, cataract in the other eye, but my recommendation not to use it anymore because uh, when you have uh, most of the patient need correction for both eyes uh, with uh, glasses. And the other things, most of the patient in the past, they came nowadays, and this is a question to you, and they already have, um, or they already had uh, cataract in one eye with the regular uh, far vision correction and uh, they need for the other eye. Uh, did you, are you aware of any uh, implantation of uh, multifocal lenses for the other eye, just only monovision? This is the question. The other things which is important and I hope all the audience um, uh, be aware of this, you know, with the near uh, bilocarbon drops nowadays, which uh, recently approved by the FDA. I'm really uh, sorry, most of the ophthalmologists, they are um, as a representative for this uh, drop. And uh, please, uh, you know, it is a bilocarbon at the end and uh, their uh, benefit is not that huge. Okay, and it will not make a dramatic change in breast biopia. So if they, this is just only if they uh, sell with 100 real for each bottle, uh, either uh, less or more, this is you are um, uh, doing some, uh, a great paper for the company. So please be aware, this is uh, in the beginning of the drops and it's uh, temporary. The real solution is uh, cor uh, corrective glasses for breast biopia. And these drops might be just only for temporary use. And um, the other uh, uh, multifocal lenses, I think the, uh, my experience with these three lenses, it's plus and minus. It depends on the situation of the eye, if the eye, the is all these things. The things is very important. Uh, there is no as, um, good lens. Uh, it's different from lens to others. And uh, eye condition like uh, dryness and other things is important. Glare, most of the patients, they are suffering from glare during night. So thank you, Mohammed, for excellent presentation and thank you all. Okay.
Okay, to answer Thank you, your, Dr. Said, for your comments. Your question about when I, uh, I uh, when I went through the literature, I saw a few papers of uh, talking about hybrid pro, uh, hybrid approach where they use um, a trifocal or extended depth in one eye and monofocal in the other eye just to avoid the phenomenon and provide a better quality for uh, the patient instead of monovision. Now, again, monovision uh, has to be well selected with a contact lens trial before going into such a procedure. Really, monovision, I don't recommend it for any patient. Okay, uh, because uh, whatever you add, it will not be just correcting for the near. For example, 1.5 plus doesn't mean, uh, especially if you remove the lens, you need a full correction, okay? And it will inter uh, interrupt the far vision. So please, for at least myself, I don't recommend it anymore. If I correct and if I point five maximum just to avoid uh, hyperbolic shift, that's all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Said, for your comment. Um, Dr. Maplog, back to the questions I'm receiving. Um, someone is asking about what is the practical way of finding the dominant eye in the clinic. Can you give us tips on that? Uh, okay, well, you, you can ask the patient to, uh, to, to point just like this and put one letter over Within that square, within that square, using the two hands, and just cover one eye and see in which eye it will disappear. Uh, the eye that will have the letter is the dominant eye, and the eye that will have no letter is the non-dominant eye. This is one way to do it. There are multiple ways to do it, but it's a bit practical. Yeah, yeah this one is the most practical. Uh, I have a comment here also from Dr. Jose Vargas. He's uh, sharing his experience with the multifocal lenses. Um, uh, he's also commenting about the fact that you have already mentioned about the strict and rigid patient selection. Um, he's also shining the light on the fact that uh, the proper evaluation of the ocular surface is very uh, important in these uh, patients. And um, about combining multifocal and uh, ADOF lens. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, can, you, can you repeat the final question? Um, the combination of uh, multifocal lens and ADOF lens in one patient. Well, uh, yes, uh, there were papers that uh, personally did not combine any patient, but there were papers, uh, and I came across patients who had monofocal in one eye and trifocal in, in the other eye. So, uh, or, uh, and there were papers talking about doing extended depth in one eye and uh, trifocals in one eye. So they call it the hybrid approach. Um, the, w w what you see in the papers that they claim that this is a good uh, successful uh, uh, approach, but in, uh, in practice, how successful it is, I don't know. I have no experience personally. Yeah, not enough. Uh, what about the effect of the ocular surface on these uh, patients? Because sometimes it, kind of, it tends to be overlooked. It, uh, it, it is uh, effective, definitely. It, it will affect the accuracy of your testing as well as the quality of vision pre and post uh, surgery. And that's why you need to be rigid whenever you Select, uh, select a patient for a premium IOL, you have to do an OCT for the posterior segment to rule out any maculopathy. Um, pent pentacam is a must. Any form of corneal evaluation with uh, fluorescein, with uh, uh, any other tests is mandatory. Uh, your IOL calculation should be very accurate with, before do, uh, putting this uh, lens in uh, so that you ensure that you achieve the good good results, though, because those patients are very sensitive to any minor refractive error or PCO later on. And that's why I mentioned that you, you need to have a YAG and eczema at the end. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another question from Dr. Ahmed. You can go ahead, Dr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for this uh, informative lecture. Uh, my question regarding the monovision, sometimes 
times you end with uh, myopic surprise in one eye, uh, post uh, cataract surgery, but uh, you didn't test uh, which one is the dominant eye. Uh, would you apply the same principle of monovision in those patients um, if it's not the do- if it's not the dominant eye? I mean the non-dominant. I mean if if we went for uh, the minus one point five or one point two two five in the uh, non in the uh, dominant eye. Would you still do the same? I mean, aim for limitrobin in the other eye, or we cannot apply the same principle if it's not the dominant eye? We understood right. Uh, if you apply the mon- monovision in the uh, uh, in, in the dominant eye and you achieved minus one, then you kept the patient for near. You, you did not apply. So you should aim for imitropy for the dominant eye. But the non-dominant should be the one for 1.5, 1. or you could do many more vision, 1.7, minus 0.7. Yes, yes, I understand. The view. But, but if you already had it by surprise, should I exchange or, or, or fix this, or we can just use the, the opposite? Well, uh, this is a this discussion with the patient. You can either uh, ap- approach it again. With, uh, you have to keep the patient. Uh, you cannot do the opposite. If, the, if this eye is the dominant eye, you cannot do it. Uh, but what you can do is uh, uh, achieve it with eczema, emetropia, or exchange the lens if, uh, if it's a big problem. But you can also achieve emetropia with eczema after putting the monofocal. So pseudophagic vision, laser vision correction. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, I think uh, this is it for the questions. Um, thank you again very much, Dr. Mutlak, for this uh, really um, explanatory lecture. Uh, we appreciate all your efforts and all the information that we have gained. And thanks uh, to everybody who has taken the time to attend uh, this lecture with us. I'll see you next time.